All right. I'm not sure if you're out there, friends. There's a little bit of a technical glitch that was going on uh, right before things got started there. I'm not sure if we're live or not. So this is going to be uh, quite exciting. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm Jim at JSTAN Studio. So it seems like every time I come on the stream, I'm always starting off things with saying like, hey, I don't know if this is quite working or not. So my apologies for that. I had a little bit of a technical glitch with the streaming software that I was using. Uh, I won't go into it, but uh, if you could drop a comment if you're out there and you can see me okay. Uh, just good to know that I'm not uh, performing to an empty room, so to speak. But uh, again, I appreciate you joining me here. And uh, today what we're going to be doing is doing a live stream painting of St. John the Evangelist. So I've been doing a couple of different types of paintings. Most of the time you've seen me do like landscape type paintings. So you see me do mountains or trees or uh, what have you. Oh good, we are live. Awesome. Um, but you see me do like landscapes, trees, mountains, rivers, so on and so forth, which is all that's great. Um, but I've been trying to kind of push my artistic boundaries a little bit. And um, what I've been doing is a couple of portrait type paintings. And I'm a Catholic, so I figured, you know, something that would be great to start off with is some of the pictures of the evangelists, um, some of those paintings. So what I have here is, let me see if I can pull these up. I started off with the painting of St. Luke. So he's the patron of art and artists, among other things, doctors, physicians, and so forth. And then moved on to St. Mark over here, who is a uh, patron saint of quite a few different things, one of the other gospel writers as well. And then on to the other gospel writer, St. Matthew. So just kind of doing that series of, uh, of the evangelists. And now I'm going to be concluding it tonight with St. John. And... Uh, what you see there is kind of my underdrawing. So what I've done there is it's pencil with uh, that I kind of did my rough lay in with. And then I went over the top with black colored pencil. And I'll go into the reason for that in a bit. And then basically what I did is I just took a very watered down blue paint and I just kind of covered the entire piece with pure water and then a very small amount of that blue paint. So basically this is um, it's dry now, but it was very wet, very slick, and the entire thing is just sort of stained blue. So what I'll go and start off with now is um, I'll start in laying some of my base colors down, um, basically just kind of flatting in some of those basic colors. And something that I've been working on recently is a digital course by Ariel Olivetti, who's a, an Argentinian um, comic book creator and um, artist that works on that. He released a course on Domestica on uh, this topic of painting superheroes in acrylic paint. And I love superheroes, I love acrylic paint, so I figured this is a great thing. It lists for like 55 bucks, I bought it for 10 bucks, I did it, and I gotta say, one of the best courses on art that I've ever taken. Um, it's really fantastic, taught me a lot of things, and has really enabled me to kind of push my art to the next level. And what I'm putting on the palette here now is uh, one of the things that he mentions in there. This is Liquitex Basics, but it's a matte fluid medium. And basically what that does is it allows you to have the same effect of water, where you get that nice transparent glazy sort of look, but it keeps the paint thick. So you're still working with a thicker paint. So that's that's... It's a really neat piece that you can add into art, and it's something that I've been experimenting with, and it's something that I had never seen before um, until very recently. I have the link to Ariel Olivetti's course that I mentioned there down in the description, so feel free to take a look at it. Uh, last I saw it was on sale for like $11, down from $45 or $50. It's worth $50, it's worth $75, it's worth a lot. Um, so feel free to check that out. It's a, it's a great course that I can't recommend highly enough. So, for starters, this is now dry like I mentioned, and I'm going to go into some of these base colors, and I'm going to be grabbing some of this matte fluid medium and mixing it with red. So I'm going to be using this as my um, skin tone base. So it's a, it's a thin paint that I'm using, transparent paint rather, uh, in red, and I'm just going to go in 
and cover the areas where I would see where you would see a skin tone color. And we're going to build up in layers on top of this as we go along. So just fill in these areas, trying to avoid areas like the eyes or uh, his clothes. It's still pretty thin at this point, so it doesn't really matter too much if I get in there, but it'll make my job easier. And uh, something that you can probably see that um, Olivetti recommended in his course was to use the black colored pencil um, and the black colored pencil primarily because it doesn't have as much um, greasy ingredients as normal pencil ink or pencil ink, pencil lead. Um, and the reason f that that makes things easier is because the paint adheres to things much more easily when it's less greasy and has that uh, less of a slick property to it. What I did with that black colored pencil is I laid in what Olivetti referred to as a shadow map. So I went in and I, I not only drew in the basic areas of color and the basic line work, but I started to shade in um, where the shadows would go and kind of thinking about the different types of shadows where you have um, more like an ambient light source and you have um, cast shadows and core shadows and occlusion shadows and all of the uh, fancy art terminology. But Olivetti explained it really, really well in that course, uh, made it very clear in terms of how you're supposed to think about shadows, how you can think about uh, light on forms, and uh, really made it clear to me in a way that um, it never really clicked to me before like it did during that course. So I keep singing the praises of that course. Feel free to check it out. It is, uh, it is great. I really appreciated going through it and how he explained things and really can't recommend it highly enough. So that starts off with uh, some of our base areas of red. On all of the other Evangelist paintings that I did, I started off with a yellow base. So in keeping with true JSTAN Studio fashion, we're going to do it live and we're going to do it in a way that we've never done it before. Uh, that seems to be one of my trademarks that's emerging. So it's interesting to me because the, the reds that I'm laying down are coming out much more purplish, uh, which makes perfect sense if you look at a color wheel or know about the wonderful world of mixing colors and so on and so forth. But it's interesting to me how I'll have to make adjustments on the fly for that. And if you're, you've been around the block a couple times on this channel, you know that I, I love trying to problem solve in real time. I think that that makes things so much more fun. And maybe that's just a streak of me being foolish or sheer hubris or something. I don't know what, but it makes things fun for me. It keeps things interesting and it, it uh, lends itself to really unique effects that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. So I've got sort of those, that first layer of skin tone laid in, at least as, as well as I can with this brush. Um, I can't get too much closer on some of these other smaller portions, but I'm going to try because who knows. Uh, so I'll wash off my brush from that red paint. This is kind of a cool setup because uh, you can see my palette, you can see the work piece that I'm working on. If I pulled this down and you wanted to see the water, that's the water that I'm using. It's a beat up old glass that I bought in a thrift store like 70 years ago at this point. And it's seen a lot of action as you can see by how maybe you can't see, but it's extremely dirty. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna grab a little bit of brown paint and I'm going to do the same thing for his hair. It's not a whole lot of uh, magic going on at this point. It's pretty much just laying in general colors, getting shapes into place, and uh, letting things fly. So feel free to uh, leave a comment or a question if you've got one in the, uh, in the live chat there. Or if you have suggestions for something that you'd like to uh, see on the channel in the future. I depicted St. John here as a, as a young man, and that's typically, I, I would say, the majority of how he's presented in artwork from just various eras. It seems like he always gets depicted as, uh, 
as a young man, which in the Bible he's described as being um, a young disciple. So I guess that makes sense, and that's fair. Um, I had con contemplated showing him as an older man because he was one of the only the only apostle that didn't die as a martyr. He actually died in exile um, when he was, I think the tradition holds that he was about 80 when he died um, in exile, like I mentioned. But for now, at least, young man won out. And I did give him a strong chin because for some reason he's always depicted with, well, he's often depicted with kind of feminine features and I always thought that that was kind of strange. Give him a square chin and a stronger jawline. Just to kind of shake things up from the way things are normally presented there. Um, all right, what's next? So I think what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to go in for the, um, the robe area and just kind of start to lay things in there. I'm thinking maybe he should have like a, uh, I'm gonna go brown for the robe, but I think I'm ultimately going to lift it up to more of a, a tan or a yellowish color. I kind of gave each of the evangelists a different color. I think I gave Mark a blue um, tunic and I gave, uh, St. Matthew, a red tunic, just to kind of get a little bit of variety going in there. What I like about using the paint in this more transparent way is that I can still largely see the shadow mapping that I've done with the, um, with the dark colored pencil that I mentioned. So I can still kind of see where it was that I was thinking I was going to place areas of shadow and light, and it kind of just uh, helps me see my guidelines a little bit better, at least at the initial phases. And then once I really start getting into layering on the paint, I have a little bit um, clearer view of where I'm going, and then I just move along. All right. So the flatting area is not, or flatting port process isn't exactly the most glamorous for a live stream, but I wanted to show you exactly what it was that I was doing there and how it moves along. Some updates from the channel actually that I wanted to share with you. Um, I did my first live show recently and I was really impressed with how much support I received from uh, friends and family in the local community and stuff. It was uh, a live show for an arts and crafts show that was done at a local mall. So that was, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. It made for some long days, but uh, it was a lot of fun. I got a lot of compliments about the art. I got some really good feedback from different people, made some friends in art who do art locally, which was pretty cool. Um, Learned a lot for what I'll do next time for live shows. Excuse me. Um, probably among those tips and tricks is maybe not to make the days so long. Uh, I think I showed up there at about 8 o'clock on Saturday morning and set everything up and didn't leave the mall until about 8 o'clock Saturday night, which when you're setting everything up and, you know, manning the booth and I, as an introvert, talking to people and, you know, not trying to sell because that's not my style and I, I get annoyed when people try to sell me things at the mall and, you know, they try to hawk you down at the kiosk and everything and you're like, get away from me. Not my style, but it was a lot of talking to people, which as a being the super introvert that I am, it was uh, a little bit exhausting. But it was, like I said, great experience, made some sales. Had some leads on new commissions. Speaking of sales, it uh, reminded me, I got a lot of new things up in the shop as well. Some things that I painted live at the mall, um, which that was a fun experience too. I did some uh, things that I've never done live at the mall, as is my custom, like I mentioned before. I painted a uh, scene with a like a timber wolf in it, and... Uh, like a boathouse type scene out on the water, so that was a lot of fun. It's interesting painting live too. I mean, I'm painting live here for you, obviously, um, and for those of you that are watching after the fact, but um, 
it's different when you're painting live in front of people that are actually walking by and who, you know, didn't come there to see you. They came to buy a pair of pants or whatever it was that they came to the mall for. That was kind of an interesting experience, too. Just painting again on this section of the robe. Part of the reason for the blue tint, I'll come back to that, um, is that it reduces the um, amount of white that your eyes are seeing when you first paint things. So a lot of times it's very difficult to for your eyes to kind of make out values and judge them correctly when you're um, when you're seeing something next to just stark white. So having that little bit of stain, even though it's a little bit, really, I've found, helps me to kind of judge what color I'm actually looking at. Um, that was one of the tips from Olivetti's course that I've heard in other places and never <laughs> followed. Um, being me, being the pig-headed fool that I am. But uh, it was something that I really took to heart, and I've noticed that it really does help a lot. Um, so definitely something that I would recommend there. Just paint in his eyebrows here. Give him some nice brown eyebrows. So yeah, the live show was great. The online storefront, which you can access through a link in the description, um, is bustling with plenty of new stuff, some new paintings. I also put in a, uh, a digital pack, which I think is kind of a neat idea. I put in a couple of my favorite landscape paintings that I've done as a digital download. So I think it's for 750, I think. Um, fact check me on that one, Snopes. But um, I think that it's 750, and basically I give you the PNG files. They've got a watermark in the corner, but you can feel free to use them as a, as a desktop background or um, on your mobile phone as a background. You can make prints of them. I only ask that if you're using them publicly that you would give me credit as the author, uh, author, <laughs> illustrator. But feel free, if you make that purchase, go nuts. I also updated it with a couple of new options for commissions. So um, I found that a lot of people were interested in commissions um, that were at this live show that I was at. So feel free to uh, get in contact with me. There's a menu of a couple of preset options. If you'd like something painted for your wall or something custom that I might be able to do for you, feel free to reach out on that. I'd be happy to do something uh, creative for you. Grabbing a little bit of a pre-mixed skin tone that I have. Normally I just use red, blue, yellow, white, black, and then brown and green depending on what the subject is. But I found that the um, using a little bit of pre-mixed skin tone just kind of makes things a little bit more even, a little bit more um, quicker for me. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start my base layers. And um, I don't really have necessarily a thought process behind this. I'm going to try to move from the bottom right to the upper left corner of the painting. Um, as I'm left-handed, that helps to prevent smudging or anything like that. So that's, uh, that's the way that I'm going to be going about it here. So I'm going to start filling in some more shadow shape type areas. And I'm going to mix up a little bit of brown, a little bit of black, and a small amount of yellow as well to kind of get a, a nice rich tone for my shadow. And I'm going to start kind of following the shadow mapping here that I have laid out. I'm not sure if you can see it super well on the, uh, on the live stream, but I can still sort of see the areas that I had um, filled in with my black colored pencil from before. Uh, like I said, it might not be super duper clear, but uh, it's definitely there for me here, so I apologize for that. I don't necessarily know if uh, that's coming across super well, but uh, not having tons and tons of money to invest in uh, extremely high-quality lighting. Um, I do my best for you, so I hope that it's good enough.
And as this is wet, I'm going to try to kind of work into it and then come back out of it with a little bit lighter shade to kind of um, loosen up some of those really hard, wonky edges that you might see. So that's just what I'm doing now. I'm just taking a little bit more of the, uh, the brown color and kind of pulling it out from these, these shadow shapes that I've developed. Of course, feel free to uh, leave any comments if you're uh, new to the stream, have some questions, want to ask what it is that I'm doing or anything like that. I might not be able to tell you what I'm doing, but feel free to ask. So it's going to be a shadow here that's cast by this part of his robe, kind of casting a shadow on the other side of his chest. Uh, one thing that I have not mentioned that is very important is light direction and kind of where I'm envisioning the light coming from. I'm envisioning this light coming from above, which is super common when you're painting religious art, um, kind of from this direction down. Um, so that was kind of where I kept in mind when I was making that shadow mapping that I was mentioning. Um, that was really what was what was in my mind when I was doing that. One thing that I think Olivetti's course does really well that, um, I don't know, maybe other people haven't explained that as clearly, or maybe I'm just stubborn as a mule or something, but um, it really explained well thinking about basic forms. So your cylinders, um, things like cones, cubes, um, spheres, so on and so forth, and thinking about how a head is made up of those things and from there, you can really um, really make good judgments about where shadows are going to land. If you can kind of graft those ideas onto a human form, like a face or a head. And Granted, that's challenging to do, to be sure, but um, it's a good way to think about it and one that really does um, help and has helped me quite a bit. I'm going to grab a little bit more black. And here, I'm going to go really, really dark on this area because it's going to be a cast shadow from his head. And cast shadows are always very dark. The cast shadows are going to be pretty much the darkest areas in your painting for the most part. So now this probably isn't looking like much for right now. But eventually, through layering, the pieces will come together. I'm going to go into some brown paint on the side. Grab a little bit of black and a little bit of that dilutant uh, matte fluid medium that I mentioned. And hit an area where his uh, arm that's holding up the quill is going to be casting a shadow. Grab a little bit more of the dark color and go underneath. This little sash area. Imagining that there's a fold in his garment that goes here. And this is going to follow up this line, come up to about here. Something that I've really enjoyed about this style is the way that Olivetti teaches it, it's purely acrylic. Um, he mentions a little bit about uh, the possibilities for adding oil, paint, and so on and so forth. Um, but what I've actually done is gone in and kind of, after the fact, done some touch-ups with just ink pens. And I really like the way that that looks. I think that it produces a very stark set of, um, of lines and gives it a unique look that almost combines sort of that... Um, icon look of sort of the Eastern rites of Catholicism, Byzantine icons and so forth, um, with the look of almost comic booky type of uh, chunky black lines, which I think it produces a really cool look in my opinion. I like it, um, but something really interesting to me. Somebody asked what's in his hand. That's going to be a quill, uh, like a quill pen that he's using for um, writing the gospel, basically. I haven't filled that in yet, just because it's going to be all white. Um, and that's going to be outlined in ink as well. But 
that's what that is there. I realize now that I forgot the bird in the background. And some of you might have been sitting there thinking, why the bird? All of the gospel writers have a, an animal that's associated with them. So, for example, St. Mark uh, is a lion. St. Matthew is a, is a winged human, so basically like an angelic being. Um, St. John is an eagle. And I've always liked the um, sort of the symbolic nature of that. So I wanted to make sure that I included that. St. John's Gospel is very different from the other three Gospels in that it recounts and records um, events that the other three Gospels, the other three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, are known as the Synoptic Gospels. And John's Gospel was written later and is more of the result of theological reflection on a lot of things. So instead of uh, being necessarily a blow-by-blow -blow account of purely what happened. Um, a lot of times the symbolism and the word choice that he uses to express the events of what happened um, in the, the life and times of Jesus is, like I said, it's the result of reflection and um, study and later thought and prayer. So it's unique in that sense because it's very, it has depth that the others, um, not that they don't have depth, certainly, um, but they, it's, it's not present in the other Gospels necessarily. Certainly not in the same way that it is in John's Gospel. So I wanted to be sure to include that bit of symbolism. Um, just because I think that it's really interesting. Eventually, uh, so this circle around here is going to be the uh, classic halo that you see the saints with very often. And then the background uh, is mostly going to get blacked out, honestly. It's mostly just going to be stark black. And I personally like that look. I think that that look kind of harkens to um, Baroque artwork. Um, so Baroque was a primarily Catholic art movement back in the day. Um, I could make up um, years that it was, or I could look it up later and probably tell you something that's actually accurate. I'm sorry for not having that prepared. Um, but it was something that was characterized by chiaroscuro, which is uh, light and shadow. It's usually a very strong, overpowering, single light source that illuminates the scene. And there are very, very deep shadows and very, very bright whites. Uh, so it creates a very dramatic, tactile, dramatic, just very powerful feel to the artwork. And it's something that I've always appreciated and really, uh, really liked and tried to emulate to a certain degree. In, in my artwork. So I'm kind of combining styles of uh, icon, comic book, and Baroque. This is what we do here. So I won't take the time to fill in the rest of the black necessarily now, but I wanted to at least get the bird um, into position and with his, uh, his flat colors in place. I'm going to grab a little bit of this lighter yellow color for the beak. Just like that. I'll probably be on this live stream for about 45 minutes, give or take. So at this point, I'm pretty sure this isn't going to get done today, which normally for my live streams it doesn't because I'm talking and just overall being a fool. Um, and not necessarily paying as much attention to the art. But I love doing it with you guys. It's kind of fun to be able to paint live, and the challenges of explaining what I'm doing as I'm doing it, I think, is a, an important thing for an artist to do, because it helps them understand things as well. All right. So I'll wash this uh, 
wash this brush out now. One other thing that Olivetti mentioned in his courses that I had never done before uh, was to start off by using a wet brush, so dampen it as you go, um, just dip it in some clean water and then start to paint. It made a world of difference. I don't know why I never did that before, but it really made a huge difference, something that I would highly recommend. I wanted to mention too, um, I think I'm gonna start doing a second layer on the skin tones while I mention this. So I'm gonna go into that skin tone color, bring a little bit of it out here, bring some red, bring some yellow, to kind of make that fleshy tone of color. You, uh, I've heard it referred to as, um, what is it, fried egg and ketchup, white, yellow, and red. Um, kind of in that order as well. Um, Olivetti mentioned using blue, which I think brings a certain richness to the color that uh, isn't present if you don't include it, but it's a very, very slight amount of blue. You can tell that even just that little dab that I entered there was too much. So I'm going to kind of dull it back with the rest of the colors. But that blue adds a certain um, richness to the color and depth that I think uh, is, is really lacking if you don't have it. Um, I think that that really does add to the punchiness. Skin is a tough thing because it really changes depending on the lighting that you're in. Um, depends on lots of different factors. Uh, to get that really perfect skin tone color that really looks like what it is that uh, that you're looking at. So I'm going to start by just applying this and I'm going to see sort of where we're at uh, with the color and from there I'm going to determine where what kind of parts of the head we're going to be painting. Here are we going to be painting shadow portions? Are we going to be painting light portions? Uh, this looks kind of uh, perfectly in the middle. Great. Uh, I'm just going to start by laying this in a little bit um, in most areas, honestly. I do kind of want to get a little bit closer to a skin tone color on his face. I'm thinking that this is a little bit darker than what I want for the average um, color. It's also a little bit more yellow, which I think could be interesting. See what happens with it. I'm not sure if you guys see it in the corner of the screen there, but I have a uh, link there, the support me at coffee.com slash whatever. Um, that's sort of like a digital tip jar. So if you guys are enjoying what I'm doing, you can feel free to uh, drop something in there. That'll also take you over to the shop itself uh, where you can look at commissions. Coffee itself has a really cool platform where you can see um, artwork that I've posted there. You can see links to social media, different platforms and everything. So feel free to take a look at that. So again, just sort of laying in um, a layer in most of the areas here. And as there's paint that's kind of coming out of my brush, this I see this color is getting darker. So as that happens, I'm going to move to areas where I need darker paint darker color. I do feel a little bit bad because, you know, obviously these are these are saints, these are incredibly holy men and women that I'm painting here, and it always looks so bad at this stage of the game. Um, but I've always managed to pull it out, and I guess things have to get uh, messier before they get cleaner. It's just kind of the way of life, but I do feel bad. So it just it, it always looks weird to me at this phase, but one thing that's fun about art is if you just don't panic, you can keep working at it and really develop something great. I'm gonna put out a little bit more dilutant on my palette. And when I say dilutant, uh, that's the matte fluid medium that I talked about before. Because right now I think that this paint is actually a little bit too opaque for my taste. A little bit too strong. But, as I said, you live and you learn. I like that a little bit better because it's a little bit thinner. Allows some of that red that's underneath to show through. I go red for the skin tones because in the shadow areas, like uh, 
if you had somebody who had like a deep crease uh, from a wrinkle or something like that, or underneath somebody's chin, a lot of times what you're going to see is some of those redder tones come out um, in those shadows. It kind of gives the skin a little bit of warmth that even in the darker area, it's still uh, got some, some red in it. It's still got blood flowing, basically. And I'm using a pretty big brush here. That's something that I've learned in art as well. Use a bigger brush than you think you need. Um, and the reason for that is that as you go through, it prevents you from getting too far into the details too early. Like at this point, I'm worried about um, shapes and values of light and dark. I'm not concerned about, you know, like painting the freckle on St. John's eyelid, you know. And when you get a really small brush, it gives you this sort of, uh, not illusion of power, but it, uh, it makes you think in a different way. And I think, for me at least, there's a real temptation to try to get too far into things too fast. You got to get the basic structures down before you can start really noodling things. Unless you're like, I don't know, the, the, I don't know, the Michael Jordan of painting or something like that. Certainly there are people who are like that, but that is not me. Gonna go in on his ear here and just paint a very thin little line of highlight color. I go on this part on his face. These areas of the cheekbones are gonna see a lot of light, so I'll go in there and uh, give him a little bit of uh, light paint there. The top of the chin here, because the light is coming from above, is gonna really hit on that um, protrusion of his chin, I guess. Um, so that's that's something that uh, to keep in mind where that light hits to make it look good and proper. Something else that's cool about this dilutant, the matte fluid medium, is that it does slow drying a little bit, um, which I I like. Um, it kind of threw me for a loop the first time that I used it, but as I've used it more and more, it's been something that I've really appreciated um, about that particular product. This is not a commercial for like Liquitex or anything like that. It's just that's happened to be what I found at Hobby Lobby and I found that it works really quite well. So I'm curious if there are any artists out there watching where you buy your art supplies if you go to Hobby Lobby or if you're if you're Michael's people or whatever. I don't really discriminate too much. I just find myself at Hobby Lobby a lot. Um it's kind of a disease, but it's what I do. It's one of my signatures. I'm going to start painting with a little bit lighter of a uh, tone on his skin. I'm doing that by adding a little bit of white, or in this case, a lot of bit of white, but I'm going to dilute it quite a bit so that it's not quite as powerful as it goes down. Um, right now, I'm just seeing that it's still not quite... The value is not quite where I'd like it to be, so I'm trying to give it a little bit of extra punch and uh, get it up to that spot. One thing that is nice about this style that I mentioned, where I've got the uh, the ink going over the top of everything at the end, is that I can add a little bit of definition in the lines that I couldn't add with the paint. Um, some people are extremely talented with getting really clean, crisp lines just with the paint layer. Um, I'm not one of those people, um, so that extra little bit of definition and pop really does uh, do me quite a bit of good. Something that I definitely appreciate. For those of you that kind of follow my work, you know that one of the comic books that I've been working on is Champions of Breakfast, which is a uh, light-hearted kind of all ages comic about a couple of different uh, pieces of breakfast food that are uh, going through this fantasy landscape in the kingdom of breakfast. Um, basically fighting against evil, you know, taking down the bad guys. 
uh, who are salt shakers and sugar cubes, of course. So I'm working on a, uh, a new issue of that, actually. One of the characters' names in there is Kung Shroom, who is quite clearly a mushroom. And it kind of details his origin story and how he comes to the Champions of Breakfast. So I've got three issues up on my Facebook page, so feel free to uh, visit that, give that a share or a like if you'd, uh, if you'd like, and f feel free to thumb through those. They're in a photo album on there. But I'm most of the way through the pencils. No, I'm all the way through the pencils. I've started the inks. So I'm hoping that that'll be done, I don't know, a couple weeks from now. Maybe definitely by the end of September. It's a fun little side project. Helps you be lighthearted to kind of think of things as a kid would think of them to a certain degree. I don't know, I think a lot of comics has gotten very serious and brooding in a way that I don't necessarily uh, think is good. I think that it's nice to have something that's a little bit more um, lighthearted. Mixing up a little bit more of the darker color of skin tone. Adding in a little bit of blue. Totally obliterating the color that I wanted to on the way, but that's all right. Here I'm making almost a purplish tone of skin, skin color. I'm going to add a little bit more of the base skin color, but I actually think that this might be useful for some of, uh, some of the darker spots. I like this. I'm going to add just a teeny tiny touch of black to that. And here we go. We're going to put it right under his chin. This chin is going to be a very dark area. And as I said, it's looking very, very wonky right at the moment. Wonky is probably the best word to describe it. But eventually, this is going to come together as we're doing more and more layers of this piece of artwork. See that I'm nearing the end of my time here, actually. One thing about the portrait kind of, uh, kind of artwork, I do take my time a lot more, I find and just kind of piddle around with it a little bit. Where do I want to put this darker color? I'm thinking about where the shadows are going to land. What are going to be areas of darkness? I'm envisioning most of his neck area here is going to be in darkness, since the light's coming from above. You're going to get a lot of shadow from the chin being cast onto his throat here. There's also going to be some shadows along this side of his head. They're not going to be as severe. So what I'm going to do is reach into this dilutant, dull this down a little bit so that it's a little bit thinner. and use the same color for the bottom of his chin here. So the part that kind of juts out is going to be getting hit by the light directly, so that will be quite bright. But the rest of his chin is going to have a shadow cast on it by that piece that juts out. So it's going to be quite dark. As long as I've got this dark color, I'll kind of hit some of these areas under his eyes and on the side of his nose. The area under his nose will also be quite dark, and it will cast a shadow on his face. I found that that's something that really helps sell the, uh, the vision of a portrait as well, is uh, to make sure that you get the shadow of uh, the person's nose casting a shadow on their face. I think that that really sort of helps to, uh, to do that. Put a little bit underneath his, uh, where his lip would kind of jut out. Put a little bit where uh, this little thing here, the philtrum, 
That will cast a very small, very slight shadow, but a shadow nonetheless. And I'll bring this shadow around. Put in a little bit of shadow here on the side. As long as I have this shadow color. Oops. Accidentally dipped into a little bit of yellow there, but it's on a sub part of the brush that I'm not going to be using for this. So crisis averted. Be doing that. Putting in a little bit of shadow on his fingers. And as long as I have that color, um, I'm going to add, and I don't necessarily need it for any of the sh skin tones yet, I'm going to be adding some black and some blue. And I'm just going to uh, put in some dark area on the background here. So I see that my time is, is pretty much up at this point with you guys. And I didn't quite uh, come close to finishing this guy. I'm sorry for uh, fiddling around so much and singing the praises of this new course that I found that's so awesome. Seriously, though, if you are looking to paint characters or even just looking to paint human figures and faces in acrylic, I would really recommend it. But there's going to be a lot more content coming. At the live show that I mentioned, I was able to paint quite a few different paintings. Some miniatures, some of those evangelists that I showed before, a landscape, a painting of a timber wolf. And I'm going to be able to post the, um, the time lapses that I took of those to the channel. So you can uh, watch me paint without hearing me blab forever. That's probably of, of value to people. I do want to post more um, like uh, time-lapse things. Let me know if that's something that's appealing to you. You can feel free to reach out to me in the comments or, or in the live chat, whatever, you, whatever you'd like. Oh yeah, of course. I'm appreciative of the fact that people come on and watch and listen. Hopefully I'm not uh, too crazy or too boring or to uh, do anything. Everything in moderation. So for this one, I'll probably finish this up in a time-lapse video, and uh, I'll post that when that comes out. You can feel free to follow me on Instagram or Facebook or um, wherever. I'll post the updates to that. You can follow me on YouTube here. Feel free to uh, subscribe if you like what I'm doing. Give me the thumbs up if you like it. Um, and you'll get the updates there, too. It'll be time lapses, so it'll be a little bit quicker, a little bit less, uh, less of me interrupting your day with weird jokes and puns and so forth. So yeah, I think for now at least, I'll leave it as it stands and uh, do a little bit of work on that time lapse. So, appreciate you joining for this. As always, feel free to like, subscribe, comment, follow me on Facebook, follow me on Instagram, Everything goes up there. Um, and thank you for joining. I appreciate it. Till next time, God bless.